For today's quiz, I have this wooden apparatus built, and it's just boards that are crossing one another at a very slight uh, angle, probably about 10 degrees, something like that. A question is simply asking, if I took an apparatus like this, it's just a weightlifting mass, and then I have a piece of all thread going through here, and that all thread allows it to get enough traction so it doesn't slip. We simply want to know, if I were to put this on here, what is the acceleration that this would go down the slope? If I just let that go like that, okay? So here's what your quiz looks like. We've done a similar quiz in the past, trying to use energy, but this time we're gonna be using uh, our slopes. Let me hold this up for camera. Oop. Instead of using speed, let's actually figure out the acceleration first. As always, mark your answer as completely as possible and then list your confidence. All right, our typical student responses include, well, it's gonna go pretty fast. And here's why they're gonna say this, because they've all taken rods and they've rolled things down these and they go really quick, not as quick as gravity, but it's still gonna be a pretty uh, quick acceleration. So most of them will say, it's not gonna be 9.8, but a lot of them will say it's gonna be half of gravity or a third of gravity. They've done problems like this with incline planes where things are sliding and they'll say, it's gonna be less than gravity, but it's not gonna be terribly slow. So that's typically what we get from students. To help students think through this, we need to let them know that, look, this is not rolling down on a rod. You have the entire rod, it's uniform in radius, and as it goes down, it's gonna pick up speed. But this is fundamentally different. Look, the contact part is even a smaller rod and you've got this massive, massive disc. So while many of them think it's gonna be very similar to a, a rod rolling down here, it's not. We've got an awful lot of inertia to deal with and we've got a small radius on our contact patch. So um, I think we're gonna have to write this one out and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. So let's go ahead and solve this problem uh, to figure out what the acceleration is gonna be. And many teachers end up teaching ramp problems, so let's actually do one of those. So the very first thing that we do on these ramp problems is we know that gravity is still acting on this mass, and I'll call this mass M, and let's say it's acting at the center of mass, so I'll bring that straight down here, and I'll call that our weight equals our mg, Clearly that slope is gonna end up pushing back up on that smaller radius right here. I've got a little tiny radius there, and then I've got a bigger radius that goes uh, right along this vector here, but I'll put this one. We've got our force normal at which the boards are pushing up on that apparatus. And because it's not going in that direction, I must have an equal and opposite straight back down, so let me draw that. And that's how we end up getting our little triangle underneath here, so I can end up putting this down, and I'll call that my force perpendicular. And this is gonna be the force right here, that force parallel. That's what's actually gonna cause it to go down the slope. And I'll say we're looking for the acceleration parallel to our slope. I'll put a little question mark right there. They will say that this is making a 10 degree angle. So I'll put 10 degrees seems like a nice approximation. We use all of our values, um, keep them as simple as possible. We can always measure it. Um, but from here, I can end up using my sine and my cosine. But whenever we're attacking one of these problems, we end up doing the sum of the forces in the, uh, each axis, the perpendicular, the parallel. Now we also have to do the torques. So let's go ahead and start writing these out. I could say, the sum of the forces in the perpendicular axis equals mass times acceleration in the perpendicular. I'll do the same thing here. Sum of the forces uh, in the parallel equals ma 
in the parallel. And let's also now do our torque. So I can do the sum of our torques equals my I alpha. Let's do the perpendicular first. We know that it's not going to be accelerating off the plane. It's not crashing down and through. So I could say the acceleration perpendicular is equal to zero. Therefore, the sum of the forces perpendicular are equal to zero. In other words, I've got a force normal. So I'll write my force normal minus my force perpendicular equals zero. Force normal equals my force perpendicular. All right, we know that. That one was pretty easy. Now, what really causes this thing to end up rotating? Well, we've got to have some kind of torque. There's got to be a friction acting on our, um, our apparatus here. So I've got friction from this small rod here, that force of friction. If I didn't have enough friction, this thing would slide, and it would uh, be a sliding problem instead of a rolling problem. So how many forces do I have in the parallel? Well, I've got the force from the weight component going down the slope. By the way, if that's 10 degrees, that must be 10 degrees also. Um, we could say this force minus my force of friction. So I've got the force parallel minus the force of friction equals our MA parallel. That's maybe all we can do for there right now. Maybe we got to go over and start working on our torques we can end up saying, what is the torque that I have? Well, I've got my force of friction acting at this small radius, and that's what's causing everything to rotate. So I can say uh, we've got one torque, and that's going to be, now let's put torque where torque equals a force perpendicular to our distance. Our force here is the force of friction acting on that small radius. So I'll put our force of friction times our radius equals our I. Well, in this case, I'm gonna ignore the tiny little bit of inertia from that rod and say everything is gonna be in that larger disc. We might even be able to say this larger radius here, uh, I guess I need to put a radius on here. I'll go right here. That larger radius, let's just say, that that is a 10 to 1 ratio. So I'll say r equals 10 of the little r. Uh, that's going to come into play when we have our inertia because most of our inertia is going to come from the big disc, not that small little rod. So let's just call this a disc. So it would be 1 half um, mass, and then we have our radius squared, and then we're going to end up having alpha. So we can end up saying, uh, where our inertia of a disk is equal to one half I omega. Uh, I'm sorry, one half M R squared. Let's keep that a large R because we're talking about the big disk here. And our alpha, I can put an alpha, acceleration is equal to R alpha. So alpha can really be thought of as alpha is A all over our radius. Now, if we're talking about the acceleration, remember that rod is actually touching the board right here. That's going to uh, tell us what our acceleration is, not the big R. The big R uh, right here is really going to be dealing with our inertia. But where it actually touches and rolls is going to be dependent upon our smaller R. So we're going to need to say our force of friction times our R equals one half M. We've got our R squared. That is supposed to be a capital R squared for our inertia. So I'll put R squared. That's the large one. Alpha would be A all over our small R. Now that R can come down with this R. And now we've got a ratio squared of our radii. And that's what's going to cause this to uh, act the way it does. The force of friction equals our one half mass, and then I've got r squared all over r, and that r down here is now going to be squared when I take it down, equals a. Let's take this into account. Let's say where um, big r equals 10r. So I can end up saying, 
uh, our force of friction equals one half our mass, and then I'd have 10 R all over R. Each of these has to be squared, and then A. Force of friction equals one half M 100 R all over, and that's squared all over R squared, A. R squareds cross out. Force of friction equals to our uh, one half M A, and then we also multiply that by 100. So I can simply say that's also just 100 over 2 is 50. So that would be 50 M A. So force of friction equals 50 M A. Once I have that force of friction, I can take that up to this uh, equation over here. I can bring that right up here, and I could say, well, force parallel uh, minus 50 MA equals MA. And these are all parallel. We're only talking about one acceleration there. Take this over to the other side. Force parallel equals, and that would be MA plus 50 MA. Force parallel equals 51 MA. So now that I have my 51, so look, this is going to be acting like it's a huge, huge mass that you're trying to accelerate down here. Um, I suspect this is going to be going rather slow. Uh, our force parallel here, we can end up saying, well, this is going to end up being our opposite side and this is our hypotenuse. So we can end up saying the force parallel would simply be the sine function. So I could write sine of theta equals opposite all over my hypotenuse. Sine of theta equals opposite, which is force parallel all over our hypotenuse, which is gonna be our weight. Force parallel equals weight sine of theta, also known as mg sine of theta equals our force parallel. I could take that right here and put this all together. Hopefully the camera is still picking this up. We'll find out. If not, I'll take it over here. Um, so I've got my mg sine, and I'm going to put 10 degrees in here. Let's just use 10 degrees, and that's going to end up being uh, equal to our 51 M A. Our masses cross out, so it doesn't really matter the overall mass on this one. And our A is going to end up being G times uh, sine of 10 degrees all over 51. Let's find out what that A is. I'll put these in. 9.8 meters per second squared sine of 10 degrees, 10 degrees, hit the sine button and we get 0.174, put that in, divided by 51. We put all that in, all together, 0.174 times 9.8 divided by 51, and we get a very, very small acceleration, 0 0.03 meters per second squared. All right, so it's going to accelerate very, very slowly. Let's go take a look. All right, I have this mass touching the bar, so it can't move yet. All I need to do is move it ever so slightly to get it going. And there's just friction right back there. Once I let it go, look at how slow this thing accelerates. It's rather amazing, but it makes sense. You've got all that inertia out there from that big, huge disc acting on that little torque on that inner bar. A really very slow acceleration. Pretty neat. All right, as we saw, that acceleration is exceedingly slow. Very, very, very slow indeed. Now you might be thinking, you know what? I think I've seen this video before. You might have seen a different variation of it. We did a very similar video with a similar apparatus, but we were trying to figure out how fast it went down the velocity. And we calculated it down the bottom. We used energy that time, and we got something like 0.2 meters per second. 
very, very slow, as we just saw here. This is what science is. When you can end up having different ways of approaching a, uh, the same problem and coming up with similar answers, that should give you confidence. So let's go ahead and use what we already have and figure out what would the velocity be at the very bottom. Now let's assume that uh, the meter sticks were crossing at about the 50 mark. So we'll say that the distance that it traveled is 0.5 meters uh, or half a meter. And let me draw this down at the bottom, put that here like so, and then I'll just draw that around something like that. And we can put a little hole in the center right here. And we can end up saying, well, this length right here, from there to there, I'll just put from there to there, distance equal to 0.5 meters. Now that we've got the acceleration, we also know the velocity initial would be zero. We could solve for the velocity down at the bottom. Again, we already used energy. We found it would be, I don't know, roughly about 0.2 meters per second. We can use our old school kinematics equations and we can list our VF, our VI, our A, our T, and our D. And we know that it's going to start at a velocity equal to zero. And the acceleration is right here, 0 0.03 meters per second squared. Let's use our distance of a half a meter, 0.5 meters. Most people know, well, most physics people know that there's three kinematics equations. And many of us know them off by heart, the first, second, or third. If I have VF and I have A and D and I want to solve for the, um, oh, velocity initial is zero. And I want to solve for the velocity final. Uh, without time, I'm going to use equation two. Hopefully, camera will pick this up over here. Vf squared equals my vi squared plus 2ad. And I can end up saying my vi is equal to zero, so I'll just get rid of that. Let me move this over just a little bit, like so. Now I can say Vf squared equals uh, 2ad. Take the square root of both sides. So I have Vf will be the square root of 2a and d. And remember, we just said approximate. It's about a half a meter. Our acceleration is 0.03. So Vf equals the square root of 2 times our 0 0.03 meters per second squared, and then we have uh, 0.5 uh, meters here. Now 0.5 and 2, they essentially cross each other out, so we would end up taking the square root of 0 0.03, and that would be meters uh, squared all over seconds squared, and I'll put that in 0 0.03 square root, and about 0.17. So let's say that that's about a velocity final equal to 0.2 meters per second. And these are just approximate, but you can see how using different techniques we can end up getting the same answer. So however you can use this apparatus, if you can't build one, you can show the video and you can show either for energy or using torque and our standard Newtonian equations that we can get answers that are fairly reliable. All right. Pretty good quiz, uh, and that's, uh, that's our quiz for today. Thank you for watching another Idealized Science Institute video. We are a nonprofit organization. If you like what you've seen, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want, leave a comment below. It's helpful to us. If you can financially support us, go to our website and hit the donate button. If you can't, simply by sharing these videos with other teachers and students in your life will be helpful. While at our website, you'll find that we have our Idealized Science Institute book. That'll help you engage your students in dialogic discourse. There you'll also find we have a podcast where we break down educational research. We also have long form lessons. If you're a teacher, you can watch these and go in the very next day and enact these. Along with this, we also have many other resources, including more quick quizzes. So thank you for watching and we hope to see you in the next one.